The lord of the castle, as the king's representative, often held courts. So prisoners awaiting trial were sometimes locked up down here. But don't imagine that underground rooms like this were always used as prison cells. In fact, they were mostly for food and ammunition. You needed good supplies if you were going to survive a long siege. Actually, the word dungeon comes from the old French donjon, and it means a keep, not a prison. It was only after the Middle Ages, when castles like this were no longer lived in by great lords, that sometimes the keep became the local jail. It was then that an unfortunate prisoner may have been confined in this dreadful hole as an extra punishment. And I can tell you, there's scarcely enough room to breathe, let alone move down here. But a medieval lord would never have kept a captured enemy knight in a place like this. Think of the ransom money he'd lose if a knight was left to rot down here. Large ransoms only go to prove just how valuable a knight was in the Middle Ages. A knight on his horse was as powerful as a tank is in today's army. You'd often find a young knight in the castle bailey doing this, riding at the quintain. The idea was to ride up, strike the quintain arm with your lance, and then get out of the way before the sandbag swung round and hit you. Once you'd mastered that, you could take part in the tournament. Jousting helped the knight prepare himself for battle. It was also a superb spectator sport. The trouble was that once you put a helmet on your head, no one could tell who you were. So knights began to wear badges on their helmets and shields. We call these badges coats of arms. Crikey, man. Absolutely boiling in this chain mail. This doesn't look heavy, but this is a hauberk and it weighs an absolute ton. And this is my coif, which absolutely presses the whole of your head down. And it's very, very tight. Knights were very well protected by chain mail, but with the development of better weapons, like the longbow, the knight needed more protection. Thomas's grandson, Richard, was a very famous knight, and by the time he became Earl of Warwick, knights wore plate armour over their chain mail. It wasn't very practical. You couldn't put it on yourself. It was jolly heavy and extremely difficult to move around in. Sometimes there would be as many as 30 different pieces in one suit of armour. but it looked magnificent. A great knight had to look splendid, even in death. Earl Richard's tomb is one of the finest in Britain. Earl Richard died in 1439 and lies here in state.
Below him are the small carved figures of mourners to show his importance. Such splendor was all very well, but it had become extremely expensive to be a knight and to own a castle. What's more, by the end of the Middle Ages, many knights didn't want to go on long expeditions with the king, so they paid a fine instead. This money paid for the peasant armed with the longbow, which had now become the decisive force in the English army. The knight had lost his military importance, and cannons were improving all the time. At Warwick, Richard III started to build a keep with gun ports to fire cannon in defence. Richard died in 1485, soon after building was begun, and no one ever bothered to finish this keep. Why? Well, because castle defence just didn't matter anymore. In fact, that was true a hundred years earlier, in Earl Thomas's time. England was a much more peaceful place by then, and Earl Thomas just didn't expect to be attacked. Look how thin that wall is. Scarcely any defence against a battering ram. Earl Thomas had seen many impressive castles when he was campaigning in France and he just wanted to copy them. So he built himself a superb place to live. Luxurious, comfortable, and much more of a home than a fortress. The front of the castle is in fact just a spectacular front door. And in the 14th century, it would have been even more exciting to look at. The castle would have had tall turrets and wooden gables painted in bright colors. The high roofs would have had gilded weather vanes and great coats of arms. Even the walls on the outside may have been painted. Gradually, as castles began to lose their military importance, people didn't want to live in them anymore. They just weren't comfortable enough. But some people continued to build spectacular homes like this, not for defensive reasons, just to show off, so a castle like Warwick could continue to provide a home for noblemen. Inside, it was changed to suit new tastes. This was once Earl Thomas's chamber. But other castles were allowed to fall into ruin. Their owners found them too expensive to maintain. Stripped of everything that could be used elsewhere, only the shell remained. This priest looks happy. His bishop has let him go on a pilgrimage. He's going to Walsingham, to the shrine of Our Lady, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he's treating it as a bit of a holiday. Here's another pilgrim. He doesn't want to go to Walsingham. He's been ordered to go as a penance, a punishment for gambling. He's got to walk all the way without shoes. And his feet are killing him. Our third pilgrim looks rather worried. That's because his wife is going blind. He's going to Walsingham to pray to Our Lady to cure her. Does that feel better, my son? I have some little skill at healing. It takes a priest to take away the pain inflicted by another priest, Father. Only God, Our Lady, and the blessed saints can take away real pain, my son, whether of the body or the mind. Hey! 
You down there. Is this the way to Walsingham? Yes. These people are visiting Norwich Cathedral. It's something to do on their holidays. They aren't all going for religious reasons. If you live in Britain today, you don't have to be a member of the church, any church. But in the Middle Ages, you did. If you lived in Western Europe, you were a Catholic. And at the head of the Catholic Church was the Pope in Rome. He ruled the church on behalf of God. From him, through his officers, came God's commands. His most important officers were archbishops, then bishops, and at the bottom were the ordinary parish priests. In religious matters, all the others, the church called them lay people, had to belong to and obey the church. The Pope was also responsible for abbots, abbesses, and their monks and nuns. There were over 2,000 monasteries in England alone. Then there were the organizations of traveling preachers, the friars. Even in politics, the Pope had great powers, giving orders to emperors, kings, and queens. So whether you were a king or a peasant, many parts of your life were influenced or controlled by the church. In fact, the church was responsible for all sorts of things that nowadays would be looked after by the government, like education, the care of the poor, the sick, the elderly. The church even had its own courts, and a priest could only be tried in one of them. As well as being all-powerful in religious matters, the church was one of the biggest landowners. Bishops and abbots, like other feudal lords, held their land from the king. Surrounded by the power, influence, and presence of the church on every side, it's not surprising that people believed in God more than most of us do nowadays. Norwich, where I'm standing, gives you some idea of the importance of the church in the Middle Ages. To start with, there's this cathedral. It completely dominated what was then one of the five biggest towns in Britain. As well as the cathedral, there were lots of churches, maybe over 70, and lots of priests, one to every 50 lay people. It's more like one to every thousand today. Each time you went to church, you were surrounded by reminders of the things in which all Christians believed. Pictures of Mary, God, and the apostles. If you were baptized a Christian, and did what the church told you was right, then, when you died, you would live with God and his saints in heaven. But if you didn't, you would join the devils and sinners in hell. Sins! A rotten teeth burning in the mouth, but you can buy forgiveness, pardons, blessed by the Pope himself. And look, holy relics, a knuckle bone from St. Peter's right hand, a feather from the wings of the angel Gabriel, and a piece of the true cross itself for a small sum. You can touch the nearest things to God on this earth. <laughs> Relics? I picked them up on the road back there. There's no wonder the partners make so much money. And how can you buy forgiveness? Well, at least the money they get goes to the poor. Well, doesn't it? Sometimes. Ah. Uh, you're getting a bit above yourself, aren't you? Just you remember, God's put everything in order. The world with its seasons, and society with each man in his proper place. Well, there's the king at the top, then the lord, and then somewhere right down the bottom, you. Oh, I know my place, but it doesn't stop me thinking, does it? You should just show a bit of respect to those above you, like the priests, for example. Priests? No disrespect to you, father, but there's a priest near our village. He can hardly read. 
He does the service in Latin, as he must. We don't understand it, of course, but neither does he. Mind you, he's got no time to learn all that. Why not? Too busy dressing up and chasing women. There's about as much chance of him going to heaven as there is of me throwing three sixes. Ah. Ah, uh, I will throw them away. Later. You'll suffer in hell for your sins. You'll hang by your tongue from a tree of fire. But you do believe in heaven and hell, at least. Well, of course I do. It's bad priests and monks and friars that I don't like. There's nothing more certain than hell. We're all equal in death, and we'll all be judged. I saw a mystery play once. It showed sinners in the world of the dead. They were saved by our blessed Christ on Judgment Day. Principes porta tolite. Open up and let my people pass. To most medieval people, heaven and hell were as real as Italy, the country where the Pope lived. And a lot of them thought that they were sure of going to heaven if they cut themselves off from the world and devoted themselves to God. Monks and nuns did this by living in separate communities called monasteries. But they still had a responsibility to feed the poor, care for the sick, and give travellers a bed for the night. Modern monks, just like medieval ones, obey very strict rules. They make a promise to God that they will never marry, that they will own nothing, and that they will always obey their abbot. Much of their life is spent in total silence. They try to serve God by studying, by praying, and by laboring. Cistercian monks have always been known as farmers. You may not be able to visit a present day monastery, but there are plenty of ruined ones around and you can work out quite a lot for yourselves about what a monk's life was like. The church was the heart of the monastery. This is what it looked like in the Middle Ages. Just next to the church was a covered walk called the cloister. It was built around a square. The monks spent much of their lives there, studying and copying the Gospels and other holy books. The cloister arches were open to the weather, and while they got the sun in summer, it must have been very cold in winter. This was the chapter house, where every day a chapter from the monastery rule book was read, and where monastery business was discussed. Next to the chapter house was the dormitory, where the monks slept. At the end of the dormitory was a double-decker toilet, built over running water. On the right, a separate channel carried the sewage away. The kitchen was further downstream. This is where the kitchen used to be. It's outside the main building, and like the toilets, it's built over running water. I expect you can guess why that was. The food was probably quite cold by the time it reached the dining room over there. Although monks lived simple, hard-working lives, monasteries became very rich. When people died, they often left money or land to a monastery. By 1420, monasteries owned a quarter of the land in Britain. Most people met their parish priests far more often than they did monks. The priest was usually a peasant like themselves and probably wasn't well educated. He might know only enough Latin to take church services and religion to teach people the Ten Commandments. But, as a priest, he had the power to baptize, marry and bury them, to give them mass and to forgive their sins. He also knew a lot about people's problems. Well, my son, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Two days ago, my wife gave birth to a child. Father, 
yesterday it died and you were away from the village and I'm afraid that since the babe was not baptized it will go to hell. My son, it's true the church teaches us that those who refuse baptism will go to hell. But do you think our gentle Jesus would punish a newborn soul? It wasn't the child's fault that it died unbaptized, but mine. Yet you should have let me know that your wife was near her time. It's my duty to tend the sick and to send the dead on their way to God. I'll arrange a burial service and you won't have to pay me. Now, is there anything else that troubles you, my son? I cursed my neighbor and wished him ill. And why was that? Well, his animals, they, they trampled my crops. I understand. But you do repent. You're forgiven. Any large organization needed money to keep it going. And in the Middle Ages, the church took a tenth of everyone's income by way of tax. This tenth, or tithe as it was called, was often paid in kind, perhaps sheep or corn. And it was stored in tithe barns. As you can see, a tithe barn was huge, up to 50 metres by eight. This one holds enough to feed an army, but in fact, most of the produce was sold. So where did all the money go? Well, some of it went to support the parish priest. There were some priests who had several parishes. They took tithes from them all, looked after one, and pocketed the difference. But there were plenty of priests who took just enough to keep themselves alive and gave the rest to the upkeep of the parish church, to the poor, and to the bishop. But if the bishops were so rich and powerful, why did they need extra money? To pay for hospitals, just for a start. This is a ward in the great hospital, Norwich. It was founded by a bishop in 1249, and more than 700 years later, in fact, until only a couple of years ago, elderly people still lived here. These little cubicles were put in in the 18th century to give people some privacy and somewhere to put their belongings. Before that, the sick or elderly were housed in open dormitories. The sick were treated with medicines made from herbs, and a lot of them really do seem to have worked. Treating colds by a herbal inhalation is a very old remedy, and so is using water to bring round someone who's fainted. But I don't like the look of this eye operation. Today, the great hospital has a well-equipped sick bay, and the elderly have their own housing. This is one of the oldest parts of the great hospital, the cloister. We've already seen that cloisters were used for studying. They were also used for teaching. And the first students were generally people that wanted to enter the church. You see, the church was the only big international organization. It had its own law and its own language, Latin. Even a parish priest needed enough Latin to say the daily services. The higher clergy needed much more education than that. If you became a bishop or an abbot or an abbess, you might have to advise the king, act as a diplomat or manage a vast estate. That's why the first proper schools grew up around monasteries and cathedrals. By the later Middle Ages, boys' grammar schools had been founded, but the teachers were still churchmen and very strict. A reading book says, Dear Master, if we do not learn well, we beg you to beat us. But a schoolboy's rhyme said, I wish my master was a hare, and all his books hounds were. And I myself a jolly hunter. To blow my horn I would not spare, for if he were dead, I wouldn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Most of what I learned at school was beaten into me. Me too. Didn't hurt as much as this, though. Never mind, you're in good company. Many's the king who's walked barefoot to the Holy House. Well, the last mile from the Slipper Chapel, anyway. Mm. It must be very important. It is. My wife's going blind. 
I had this image made in wax to leave at the shrine. When it's blessed, she may be cured. Well, go on, laugh. No, faith can heal. Real faith? And I'll take back some holy water to bathe her eyes with. Well, don't take it all. I need some too. For yourself? To cure the lepers of my village. I've come for them. There'll be an all-night vigil. Will you join me? Yes. If my wife's cured, I'm going to come back here again with a gift. I would have thought the church was rich enough already. You have no right to... Will say... you pray with us tonight? Perhaps. I probably won't be able to sleep anyway. Because of being so near the shrine? Nah, because my feet will be killing me. <laughs> oh, come on, then. Or we won't even get to the slipper no. chapel. The Slipper Chapel was a mile outside Walsingham. Pilgrims used to leave their shoes outside and go in to pray. Then, without shoes, they walked the rest of the way to the Holy House. Shrines like Jerusalem, Rome, Canterbury, Compostela in Spain, were visited by tens of thousands of pilgrims every year. And an official souvenir industry grew up round them. If you wanted to show that you'd visited a particular shrine, you bought a badge. This badge comes from Compostela. If you couldn't afford the badge, you simply put a scallop shell in your hat. And this one comes from Walsingham, where our pilgrims are going. The badges were mass-produced. You simply poured hot lead into a mould like this, waited for it to cool, and then out came the badges. Other craftsmen were employed to make little bottles which would be used to hold holy water or oil which had been blessed and which would then be rubbed onto wounds to soothe and hopefully heal them. The priest and the married man will have theirs filled when they get to Walsingham. But what about the gambler? Will he still be just as scornful when he gets there? Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In November 1992, the Queen's Great Palace at Windsor Castle caught fire. For several hours, the ancient buildings blazed. The fire at Windsor Castle and the question of who should pay for the damage rekindled a debate about the monarchy in Great Britain. We asked some Windsor children for their views about the Queen and the rest of the royal family. Do we still need them? I think it's a good idea to have the Queen because she's someone that people can look up to. I don't see why we should get rid of them because they've been there for years and years and years. Uh, what have you escaped just now? What chances have you escaped? Well, Max, I think that if the monarchy are to stay, they should give a good impression. So far from the media, we've heard about the marriages in the royal family that they have been breaking up. I don't think a lot of people look up to the monarchy now because of all these breakages. Certainly the newspapers are full of stories about the royal family and people's interest in them is tremendous. Wherever they go, the television cameras follow. But why do we still have a queen? 
Why do we have palaces and processions and golden coaches? What, in fact, does the Queen do? We asked historian Dr David Starkey. 